So uh, we welcome you back to this business over breakfast. And um, we today are looking at how we build a diverse pipeline of talent. And we are so excited to be addressing this issue today because it is one that businesses seem to constantly grapple with. It's, it's how can we consistently recruit and retain a diverse talent pipeline. And the data shows that most organizations have come up really short. While women and underrepresented, upper, underrepresented minorities are fairly well represented in entry level positions, they are severely underrepresented in senior management and especially at the C-suite. Here to share her research-based insights about building a diverse talent pipeline is Erica Hall. She's an associate professor of organization and management at the Goizueta Business School. As a trained social psychologist, Erica's research explores the powerful impact of stereotypes and the hidden content within them. To create a more meaningful experience for her students, at the her students, excuse me, she created she had them create and share TikTok videos for employers for academic credit in her new course called Bias in the Workplace. Erica's course, which is a requirement for the school's new DEI concentration, received an unprecedented five out of five score from her students in its inaugural run. In today's session, Erica is going to talk about the concept of the leaky pipeline, which we've all heard you know, where women and minorities leave organizations or decide not to apply to an organization and potential actionable solutions that each of us can take to mitigate the pipeline challenges. Erica will spend the first 30 to 35 minutes sharing her insights followed by our typical about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. We invite you to place your questions in the Q&A box at the, on your Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen and we will do our best to get to uh, as many of those questions as we can. We've received some feedback that we have never explained. Um, closed captioning is available on our webinars. And so if you need any assistance with that feature, just pop a private chat into the chat to any of the panelists and we will try to get that help for you. I hope you enjoy our time with Erica today and we look forward to seeing you back on December the 15th. So Erica, over to you. Thank you so much, Pam, and good morning to everyone. It's such a pleasure to be with you bright and early. So today we're going to talk a little bit about building diverse pipelines of talent and organizations. I'm going to point out a few of the major hindrances in pipeline development, and I'll lead you to some resolutions that organizations have used to combat them. Uh, but first, I want to start by telling you a little bit about me and where I draw my experience from on the issue. First off, I'm originally from New Jersey. Just to get a sense geographically of where you all are coming from, pop in the chat and tell us what area of, of the world that you're coming from today. Let us know. Let's see, we have a couple. Lots of Atlanta. I've lived in Atlanta for eight years, so I consider myself an Atlantan. But we have Jamaica, where I was last week. We were in Kingston. Nice. It looks like we're all over the place, which is excellent. I'm excited to talk to everybody from everywhere. So I received my PhD from the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University, where I investigated the interplay between management and social psychology. Uh, prior to that, I, had, I got a BS in finance at University of Maryland, College Park, so I am a proud Terp. I also spent several years as a research associate at Harvard Business School, where I looked into entrepreneurship and accounting. So there's a diversity of topics within business that I studied or research, and all of this brought me back around to how can I use these topics to investigate my interests. One of my interests was in negotiations, and the other was in race and gender bias in organization, organizational environments. So although this might qualify me to stand up before you and lecture you early in the morning, over. this is actually what drives the work I do. So this is a photo of my husband, my two-year-old son, and my five-year-old daughter. 
And because my daughter is now in kindergarten, she's at that interesting stage in life where pipelines start to become relevant. Tracking comes into play at the stage where kids are slotted for gifted, the main curriculum, or some begin to fall off the track altogether. And you may have heard of the school to prison pipeline, which is a severe form of how kids may fall off track to the margins of society. However, I like to think of a school to C-suite pipeline and stay cognizant of how people like my daughter meaning people of her race and her gender, may leak from the pipeline without being able to take grasp of the most powerful roles in the business world. So today, what we're going to talk about is the corporate pipeline, and specifically how women and minorities fall off the track altogether as they exceed the career hierarchy. This graphic is taken from McKinsey's Lean In Report for Women in the Workplace, and it details representation by race and gender. So one striking takeaway is that diversity actually exists in the workplace, but for certain levels. So if you look at the entry level, roughly 36% of entry level workers in the corporation are people of color, whereas people of color currently occupy around 40% of the population, not too bad. Uh, roughly half of the entry workers are women, not too shabby at all. However, as we make our way through the corporate pipeline, the diverse representation we see at the entry level diminishes. By the time we're at the C-suite, people of color constitute only 18% of C-suite executives, and women are only 26%. So my question to you, and I really want you to engage and write in the chat what you think here, is what happens between entry-level positions and the C-suite? that purges so many women and people of color. Okay, so write in the chat what you think happens between entry level in the C-suite where everybody filters out. Okay. As you're writing that, I'll detail what we're gonna focus on today. So we're gonna focus on these leaks in the pipeline starting from the very start of someone's entry into a company through to the end. And we'll examine all the ways that someone might filter out at certain points. And so that we're not completely helpless here, we're also going to discuss solutions to every problem that I bring up. So at every exit point, we'll try to retain the talent and advance them up the hierarchy with actionable solutions that businesses can use. So if we go on this journey, to me, it starts with our recruiting pipelines. Then we go on to performance evaluation, pay raises, promotions, and then we land at the top of the hierarchy in these diverse leadership teams. So first we'll talk about recruiting. Let's start from the beginning. Companies have some common practices when they wanna recruit talent. So the first is that they may use language within job postings that signal that there might be some barriers for women and minorities that it won't exactly be easy because they don't fit the prototype of the ideal worker at that organization. And the second is that companies often say there's no diverse candidate pool, there's no pipeline. But we find in actuality that companies have streamlined their recruiting list for only a few elite schools or um, primarily white institutions, PWIs, places where they're less likely to find a plethora of diverse talent. And to begin dissecting solutions to this, I wanna introduce you to the concept of fixed and growth mindsets. In a fixed mindset, recruiters might look for a specific type of person. So they look for specific pedigrees, specific degrees. They want you to come in having all the skills and the qualities necessary for being a top dog at the company. And, and with this mindset, People typically recruit from outside of the company. Conversely, with a growth mindset, recruiters believe that people can be developed. They look for people who have potential and a willingness to morph and grow to become the ideal worker for the company. So they recruit from within the company and bring people up through the ranks to the C-suite. Okay, so this is fixed mindset, growth mindset. 
And if we think back to the first issue, which are these job postings, whether a company has a growth or fixed mindset is evident in the language that recruiters use to recruit people. So there's a company called Textio that will analyze your job posting and tell you analytically with the words that you used in that posting, the diversity that you're likely to get in your applicant pool. For example, they show you that the words in the blue tend to have a more masculine tone. So phenomenal, under pressure, where the words in the purple have a more feminine tone, inspired by our team. Therefore, you're likely to increase your representation of women in the applicant pool um, by including these purple words. So words like proven track record indicate a fixed mindset and may signal to newcomers that you're looking for a fixed type of person. And the fact of the matter is that person, that fixed type of person, that prototype has not historically looked like them. So they'll be reticent to apply. For a solution using Textio to incorporate more growth mindset language will help even out the diversity in the applicant pool. Companies can also increase their applicant pool by going to specific geographic areas that have higher proportions of diverse talent. So in this analysis that was done, they looked at where the diverse tech talent lived. And they found that this talent was concentrated in six states. I, I want you to guess here, what states were they? Any guesses, feel free to guess in the chat what these six states were. Now, companies with ample resources can develop hubs in these specific regions to increase diversity, or with the proliferation of remote positions, they can hire remotely, but target these specific areas. Okay, back to the states that you were guessing. They are Georgia, Texas, Delaware, Virginia, Connecticut, in Maryland. And I'm happy to see that when I asked about the geographic regions that you were coming from, a lot of these areas stemmed up. Companies can also develop diverse pipelines through paid internship programs. So there was a writer named Jeffrey Salingo who once interviewed a host of highly successful people to find out what they had in common that might predict future success for others. He found three things that predicted their success. And I love this engagement. So write in the chat what you think they are. A group of successful people, I believe it was like 100 successful people, he found three things they had in common that predicted their, faith, their success. So I'll come back to that. But I'll give you the first one, which is that 80% of the people he interviewed had had at least one internship in college. So a study done at Wharton showed that an internship was effectively worth 0.21 added points to your GPA. So what does this mean? This means that if you have a 3.6 GPA, with an internship, it is perceived as favorably as someone who has a 3.8 GPA. However, just working for money made no significant difference. So what's the problem here? Not everyone can afford not to work for money. And offering an unpaid internship limits your socioeconomic diversity in your recruiting pool. Um, before going deeper on this, what were the three things that predicted the highly successful people's success? So 80% of the grad graduates in the group had at least one internship. 64% committed to a major without changing it. And 43% had less than $10,000 in student loan debt. These were the three things that predicted the success of this group of highly successful people. Okay, companies can take steps to provide pay for internships. Um, this is something that the White House recently did earlier this year, which will provide an access point for students who have financial needs. Okay, so we have a solid pipeline. People have decided that they want to apply and we've located the diverse talent that we're looking for. We may encounter that women and minorities leak out of the pipeline at the application review stage. 
So first, I want to explain the concept of what an audit study is, which is a really cool thing. As researchers, what we do is we create these fictitious uh, either application forms or resumes. And they're all identical. Say we have two and they're identical, except for we change the names on the resume. So one will either have a male name or a female name, or they could have a black name, stereotypically black name or stereotypically white name. And then we send these actual resumes out to actual employers and we assess the uh, percentage of callbacks that are positive that we get from each of these resumes. And that's how we're able to audit discrimination within the system. Okay, so these audit studies have been done uh, often throughout time and have found really interesting insights. One is that names that sound black versus white tend to be discriminated against. So for a pivotal study that was done in 2004, Jamal needed eight additional years of experience to be judged as qualified as Greg, even though they had identical CVs or resumes. Um, Jennifer was offered $4,000 less in salary than was John. As of 2017, about five years ago, they did a large comprehensive study of all these audit studies that had been done. It's called a meta-analysis. And they found that the levels of discrimination were largely unchanged. I recently, in the past two years, have done um, an audit study myself, and I found that the callback rates for Black men are uh, abysmal. They're very small. Okay, so one way to remedy this is through a concept called blinding. So software programs can filter resumes and expose only the portions of the resume that are not prone to bias. For example, they would shield the names on the resume and other affiliations that would indicate somebody's minority membership or um, if they were female as well. So names and affiliations. And companies like Talvisa will allow you to select which aspects of the resume you want your employees to be privy to. However, blinding, as it's called, comes with some caveats. Can you think of some reasons why blinding might backfire? Put them in the chat if you can think of some reasons why blinding might backfire. And to tell you about this as you're, as you're thinking that through, I want to explain this study that was done in New Jersey based on um, Ban the Box. So what was Ban the Box? I believe it was back in 2015 when this legislation changed, but there was some advocacy that was um, wanted to prompt people to remove the box that says, have you been, um, are you a criminal offender or have you been um, convicted of a criminal offense from applications? Because what they found was that that was a non-starter for people. If you selected that, then they didn't get a chance at redemption. They didn't get a chance at the job at all. So I believe it was in 2015, New Jersey decided to ban the box. Researchers looked at the before and after in terms of discrimination of who was getting hired when the box was then banned. What they found was after the box was banned and no longer on the application, there was a lot more discrimination for Black men in particular. What is this? Why, why is this happening now that the box is going? In actuality, what they found was people made assumptions given that the box wasn't there and linked it based on stereotypes. So they thought that Black men were more connected to criminality. And because of this, they said, I don't have this information that was given to me with this box. So I'm going to use a proxy, which is that this person is a black man as a stereotype and discriminate based on that. So what does this mean in terms of blinding? You either have to blind everything or be very, very careful about how blinding is used and the consequences that it could have. Okay, hiring committees are also guilty of shifting their criteria to match the person that they instinctively want to hire from the start. And there's a fabulous um, experiment that really exemplifies this. So listen to this. Okay, the police force wants to hire a police chief and there are two candidates. They get together about 50 citizens to advise and make a recommendation. Candidate one is a streetwise cop. 
Okay. He spent many times out in, in the streets and he's worked for 20 years. Candidate two is an educated cop. So she has a criminology PhD. And then the hiring committee is then asked, okay, how should we weight formal education here? Nonetheless, another group of 50 citizens actually sees the reverse. So another group sees that the guy is the one with the criminology PhD, whereas the woman is actually the streetwise cop. And they're asked to figure out how they're going to weight educational experience. The results are astounding. So what we find is that when the applicant was educated and was a man, so this blue bar to the far left, education was rated as being super important. However, when the woman was educated, the second bar in, education was suddenly just not so important anymore. When the applicant was streetwise and was a man, the third bar in, education was just uh, not so important. But when the woman was streetwise, the final bar, education became super important yet again. So the hiring committee shifted their criteria to value whatever the man had more of. And the man was the person who they wanted to hire from the start. How might we mitigate this? Well, first, we want to write down the qualifications that matter before reviewing the candidates. So nobody gets a chance on the hiring committee to say, Ooh, this person, I just have a gut feeling about, and I think this person can do the job. Okay, structured interviews can also increase consistency and objectivity. Um, the other thing is there's a fabulous website called Bias Interrupters, and it has tiny bits of actionable things that you can do within hiring committees and without to eliminate bias throughout your process. And that's something hopefully that organizers can put in the chat if they haven't already. Okay. Erica? Yes. Before you move forward, we got a question. Are you aware of or familiar with any companies that are currently hiring using the blinding techniques you've talked about? Yes, um, I can. So it's a common practice actually, blinding. I can't pinpoint exact companies that are using it but um, I, I guess I can follow up later with the percentage of companies that are using it. It's still pretty common that people do it. It's based on kind of um, a colorblind ideology, right? So if we don't see color, if we don't see these uh, attributes that might link us to bias or stereotypicality, then perhaps we can have a fairer process. Right, thank you. Sure. Um, okay, so say we make it out of recruiting and hiring, and we have done all the right things, and we gain entry into the organization, performance evaluation could be the next roadblock for us. So performance reviews can be biased, and this bias is most likely to show from people who think they are the least biased of them all. So because people think they're fair, they let down their guard and are not accountable for their actions, and this is where bias actually happens to creep back in. So in the paradox of merit, 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 meritocracy, goodness, um, people who are the most meritocratic actually don't account for their actions and tend to be the most biased in terms of performance reviews. Performance reviews that are unstructured tend to be the most detrimental. So if we think of our performance reviews, there are some objective um, categories we can uh, cross off. How much money did this person bring in? How many clients did they bring in? However, there's this subjective open box, which is, you know, tell me more, add more insight about this particular employee. Now, the subjectivity of the open box is where bias tends to seep in. OK, when it's unstructured. And I'll give you two different stereotypes that are prevalent within the open box. The one that we often see in open box or unstructured performance reviews is the motherhood penalty. So this is where evaluators discriminate against highly successful mothers. The odd thing about it is that they tend to see them as less warm, less likable and more interpersonally hostile than otherwise similar workers who are not mothers. 
The other thing that pops in are gender stereotypes. So there was a review of a Fortune 500 tech company, and what they found was that men and women equally were both described as having technical ability, right? But women were described as too aggressive, where men were described as soft. So this idea of um, taking charge was also valued for men, but it wasn't valued for women. So these different things tend to pop in when the performance reviews are less structured and are more open box. Another problem is that evaluators may be too lenient in the evaluations of women or people of color and not give as much critical or constructive feedback. Why might this be? How can we explain this? So um, I actually want you to type in the chat to see if you kind of understand the psychology behind this. But as you do so, I'll introduce you to an experiment that exemplifies this issue. So study participants were tasked with giving feedback to study to other students on an essay. The essay was terrible. Typos, errors, everything. They were told to give subjective feedback. How was the content of the essay in general? Or objective feedback. So did they cross their T's and dot their I's or commas in the right place? And lastly, they were aware of whether the writer was actually white or black. So with the subjective feedback, Blacks were given far better ratings and less constructive feedback than whites were. With the objective feedback, there was no significant difference. So we can make some conjectures as to why this may have occurred. Um, one, the participant could have felt that the Black candidate wasn't worth the development. The participant um, could have felt scared about appearing biased, so they went easy on the candidate. But hey, either way, the Black candidate did not get the constructive feedback that they needed to progress and develop. That's why this in particular is detrimental. Leniency, bias in the subjective dimension and not on the objective dimension. Okay, so this is a summary of some of these performance evaluation biases that can occur, but I wanna be cognizant of time. Um, so I'll just briefly go through them. Confirmation bias is where Ambiguous information leads to stereotype consistent judgments. Um, leniency bias is when we're patronizing or soft on certain groups and shifting criteria is how we might shift the criteria of what we want in a candidate only when we know what the candidate that we actually want has. Okay, what can we do? Write down observable and objective criteria that defines what good work is. Audit for biased language. We learned how to do that with Textio, right? And to combat cognitive biases, which usually happen when we're under mental stress or time pressure, gather feedback throughout the review period and from multiple perspectives. So for example, when our memory is the what we're relying on, we tend to have more biases thinking back about what the person actually did. Okay, here are a few things to look for when evaluating the evaluators. Um, so for confirmation bias, if there's a, within the open box, there's a stereotypical statement, look further into it. So for example, if there is a statement of this person is incompetent, and incompetent links to a stereotype of Blacks, for example, then maybe look further into um, the assessment that was given. Attributions, does the evaluation focus on actual performance or attributional interpretations? For moms, a lot of times we see in these performance evaluations that they say, oh, this person had other outside personal concerns that kept them from doing the work. And I know this person's a parent, right? That attribution often feeds into bias and stereotypes. Leniency bias, does praise seem overdone and doesn't convert into promotions? So if this person is getting glowing reviews and positive evaluations, but is still not getting promoted, then that means that maybe leniency bias is occurring. Also shifting criteria to the qualifications or benchmarks, shift to favor the strengths of the in-group, meaning um, the person, the majority group at the company rather than the out-group or the minority. Say we made it through performance evaluations. How does that then contribute to pay? Let's take a look. 
So work by Emilio Castilla shows that bias factors into both the performance evaluation, which we just saw, and also the salary. So for example, there is this still a mysterious performance reward gap where for the same level of performance, minority employees' salary increases um, at a lower rate each year of tenure on the job than do white male employees. So while this exact trigger of the performance reward gap is currently unknown, there are ways to try to avoid it. And the two main lever, levers rather, to avoid this are accountability and transparency for the process, the outcomes, and the audience. So people are made accountable for their actions, scrutinize and check their actions so that they don't fall prey to bias. Similarly, transparency helps by adding structure. So if both the manager and employee know what inputs are supposed to affect pay, you'll have a fairer process. This chart is worked by Emilio Castilla's 2016 paper. All right, let's move on to promotions. So one um, leaky part of promotions has to go back to the broken rung analogy. And I'm not sure if anybody's familiar with it, but if we think of our um, career trajectory, we often think of it going upwards vertically, right? So that you're climbing a ladder to the top or to the C-suite. What the broken analogy, rung analogy says is that along this ladder, there are certain rungs that make you slip off a little bit to the side. And one of these is that some of the tasks that minorities and women are asked to do are ones that um, not everybody wants to do, right? So the office housework, so to say. This would be on a more overt level, bringing the coffee, the Starbucks coffee for the rest of the group. But it could also be writing up the report or the glamorous work in the corporations is being client facing, right? So meeting the client and developing those relationships, doing a presentation that the CEO also sees. So what they found is that women often volunteer or are voluntold for these um, housework kind of um, tasks and positions. And when it comes time to performance reviews and promotions, those don't factor into what advances you within the organization. So what can you do? You can be extremely conscientious about tracking who gets the glamour work versus the office housework. You want to also establish criteria to achieve promotion and make this both transparent and also have some accountability to it as well. Okay. And finally, if we survive, if we don't leak out the pipeline due to any of the previous roadblocks, we land at having a diverse leadership team. However, um, the problem in this is that people do leak out at those many exit points that we discussed while going through that trajectory. There was a really sober report by a sobering report by McKinsey in 2021 that said it would take about 95 years for Black employees to reach talent parity, which means 12% representation, which is around what Black representation is in the population across all levels in the private sector. Um, at the very top, it seems like we're stagnant. 10 years ago in 2012, there were six CEOs in the Fortune 500 that were Black. 10 years forward in 2022, there are still just six CEOs, which is just 1% of this Fortune 500 CEOs that are Black. So it seems like as much as we are really trying to move, in, move the needle, at least at those very top levels, they're not being moved. Um, the other thing that I did want to discuss is that when people of color or women make it to the very top, a bias that we see is that they're on thin ice, which is that the first mistake that they make often results in a fall from grace. So what some work has been done by uh, Ashley Rosette and, and Robert Livingston to show that there's kind of this glass cliff 
Black women make it to the top, but they're disproportionately punished when they're at the top, resulting in them not occupying that position for very long. What can we do then at the very top? Well, across all levels, we wanna make racial representation levels transparent. One thing that I see among organizations and their DEI websites is that they'll say, hey, we're super diverse. You know, we have 64% people of color and the majority of that diversity is concentrated in the entry levels positions, which we saw. What they're not showing, what the transparency is, is not showing is that across all levels of the pipeline and especially at the very top, we're not seeing the diversity anymore. So a breakdown of representation and hiring by job level will keep people accountable. Um, also showing promotion rates by different demographic group um, and share goals and track progress publicly. There was an initiative in Boston. This is now more than a few years ago, so I'm not sure if it still happens, but a collection of companies came together to say, we are all gonna be transparent about our racial representation, a certain deadline, and we're gonna all show by these various levels what our racial and our gender representation is. The more that you have that transparency, as Amelia Castillo would say, the more people can be held accountable for their actions and also work or be motivated to um, increase the diversity at even the top levels. You can also, in terms of accountability, issue penalties for not meeting these diversity goals, right? So it doesn't have to be like a strong penalty, but there are some companies that tie diversity to compensation or to bonuses or to any motivating incentive factor. And in these companies, you do see that the needle gets moved a little bit more each time. All right. I am right there on time. I think a little, maybe a, a minute early. And I'd love to hear any questions if you have any. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Erica. We've had several questions come in. A number of them have come in just to the panelists. So I'm going to go through some of those. I've pulled them off the chat because they came in um, at various points. Sure. So William asked, is there a discernible difference in evaluation bias with the trend towards flattening organizations where there's more direct reports reporting to the same manager or mm. has that had no effect at all? That's interesting. So I want I don't want to speak out of turn because I'm not aware of any research that has investigated that. So I'm not sure empirically it hasn't been done, but what it is is fodder for good research projects that I or other people can do. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then we had a question that came in that said, you talked about biases creeping into performance evaluations. What are some ways to raise awareness of biases that you observe occurring in your organization without creating a call out culture? Yeah, so this is interesting because it delves into this whole phenomenon of diversity training. Whether you are aware of it or not, there's been some con controversy over diversity training. Um, several people have said that there's backlash for diversity training when we give out these things on racial bias and we make it mandatory and tell people to come. People say, I don't want to be here and I'm not going to listen to this information. I'm even going to react against it. But people like uh, Frank Dobbin, who has a wonderful book uh, that should be right behind getting to diversity, right, have showed how diversity training can work to actually inform people. One of the main tidbits that he shows is that it should actually be voluntary rather than mandatory. And in doing so, you create an environment for the people who are willing to move the needle and be cognizant of the biases that they might have to learn that information. So uh, I won't delve too far into diversity training and the components of it that make it beneficial, but it does still work if it has these particular components. And that's how most people learn about the stereotypes that they face in performance evaluation. Okay, great, thank you. Um, actually, a 
question just popped in. I'll go ahead and get to that one and then come back. So I've got a question, that's, but two different questions that are kind of interrelated. Sure. And to ask, is there any research as to how the applicant tracking systems used by corporations have been updated as to how screening is done to be more diversity prone? So, you know, there's always those automatic screening mechanisms. Are you aware of what changes might have occurred there? Um, unfortunately, I'm not aware of if there is any research based on that. I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's fair. Um, we had two separate but related questions. So I'll give you both of them, even though they kind of address different areas. Sure. So one was, um, as an individual employee, what are some practical ways I can raise awareness of these particular DEI issues that you've covered? Actually, I'll, I'll let you answer that one. And the other one's more about policy. Sure. So this is a question that I often get in my MBA classrooms and my undergraduate business classrooms, which is, yes, all of the things that you talked about are great for our organizations to do, but me as an individual person, what power do I have, right? So there are certain things that you can do on an individual level. For example, um, if we go back to the allocation of tasks, which is a big thing for women specifically, but also minorities, if you are there and you notice that there is a difference or an asymmetry in how people are being delved out work, you can say, can we actually rotate a little bit? I noticed that Jen was the note taker probably for the last five times, but you know, I'm willing to do it and maybe we can pass it on to John, right? So there are subtle things that you can kind of nudge a manager for to make sure that things are a little bit more equitable. The other thing is being cognizant of the people below you. One thing that is um, very helpful are mentoring programs and sponsorship programs. One thing we know is that there's a dearth in sponsorship for Black women specifically, right? Mentoring and sponsorship for Black women. So reach out and mentor somebody that's below you. But beyond that, sponsor them as well. What's the difference? One is giving advice. And the other is telling somebody higher up about that person's capabilities so that they're able to get promoted in the future. So I would say those are those are two things. Great. Thank you. And then the somewhat related question is, what are some things that individuals can do who are not in the DEI space or HR space that are establishing policies and practices could do to help change those policies that might mitigate um, bias and discrimination? I actually feel like those people are the most powerful, right? Because um, there has been research to show that if you're in the DEI space or you're a person of color or a woman um, and you speak up about DEI issues, then your impact is not as powerful as somebody who is outside of that space, right? Because people consider that perhaps it's self-serving. But the people who are outside of the space appear to people as more objective. So to the extent that you are outside of the sphere, you are really going to push the needle when you speak up. So speak up to a manager, speak up through whatever channels that are given to you within an organization, go to HR or the DEI team and say, not only do I think that something should be changed, I'm also willing to commit a little of my time to help change it. And that's what's really compelling for people. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Marcella asked, what are your thoughts around sponsorship programs as a way to increase minority representation in senior and executive levels? And perhaps I will add to that, you know, do you have any advice on how to seek out a sponsor? Because I know there's some political... Sure you know, navigation involved in that because of the political yeah. capital needed. Absolutely. Um, so I'm in favor of it, right? I'm really in favor of it. If you give people a chance to interact and really get to know somebody, then authentically they can say, oh, this person is valuable. And I would have never come in contact with this person to know to sponsor them. So I'm in favor from that um, angle. It is true that sponsorships that are more organic are also more successful, right? Because people feel like they had choice in being able to seek out a person that they felt was promising. So 
I say that because if there are more informal programs that can be used for people to intermingle, where it's not directly saying, oh, you are the sponsor of that person, but a way for them to show their accomplishments to people that are higher up, then that's the best because it is more authentic. You could also have a gentle nudge as well. You can say, um, sponsorship in general is, is very helpful. So, you know, in this mixer that we're having today, if you know of any accomplishments that any of the people that you meet today are, tell somebody else about it, right? Tell somebody in power or tell somebody that's a higher up if you feel like they could be slotted to a different part of the organization that might be helpful to their career or the organization itself, make that connection. So they can have the gentle nudge as a prompt, but um, an informal way of doing it is probably the most effective. If you can't do it informally, then I think having making those connections is also beneficial as well. Mm, I love that. And it reminds me of some advice I got earlier in my career. And that is, you know, oftentimes a senior level person might ask, you know, what project are you working on now? Sure. And so always have an answer and know what impact that project is driving to the organization because, and then share the, how you're excited about it. You know, I'm excited because this is going to drive fill in the blank, right? Um, yeah. it, it just shows that you're connecting the work that you're doing to adding value to the organization. Absolutely. And um, you did have a latter question. Do you want me to address that too? Oh, go ahead. Yes. Um, about how to seek out sponsorship. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's extremely consequential there's a study that was done that um, I think exemplifies this. They did a study maybe 20 years ago now at a company, and they found that uh, women and minorities upon entering an organization were not negotiating higher salaries or negotiating at all. So there was a difference in compensation. And so they investigated and they were like, why is this? Why is this happening? What they found was that white men typically had a tie to the organization before entering it and found out information or salary norms from the company before even coming in. Women and minorities didn't tend to have these ties. So this is what happens to show you a direct result of how your network or the lack thereof can have consequences that are tangible, like your salary, right? Um, so one thing to do is really be intentional about developing your network. Sometimes we don't always like to go to the lunches, right? We like to decompress by ourselves. And that whole workday was a lot. So I want to take some time to myself. Go to the lunches. Go to the golf outings if you can, right? Whatever area there is for you to interact, do so. Also, it's great to set up informational meetings to meet people and um, expand your network. To be most effective with this, always just ask for somebody's 15 minutes of time. Most people can spare 15 minutes, right? And be very flexible about when that occurs. But you can use that as an anchor point to meet somebody else, but also be expanded to their network and get within it. I love that, Erica. And as a shameless plug, because this is something I'm passionate about, <laughs> Um, after the new year, we are, we will be launching registrations for our executive women's leadership program. And Beautiful. two of the components in that program are negotiating for yourself and separately building strategic relationships. And so, okay. um, you know, folks that are interested can look for information about that after the new year. Um, okay, so Gary has put a little interesting twist with his question. That is, do you have any data that shows how nonprofit organizations are dealing with diversity? Ooh. See, if I had extra time, I could go back and I can look up all the recent research on this. For the other questions, I wasn't aware of the research. I know that there is research on this that looks at the nonprofit space um, versus the for-profit space. I can't recall the data right now and what the findings were, but yes, this data exists and there are papers that look into it. Well, and it would just, you know, here I might be exhibiting one of my biases, but it seems that so many nonprofits these days are focused on some aspect of um, diversity, inequity um, related topics, whether, you know, it could be 
food insecurity even, but still that's an inequity topic. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question around um, what are the most effective actions that corporations might be able to take to fix the broken rung for women at the executive level? Mm, okay. Um, so for this, I would argue that being very conscientious about writing up the tasks that people do is important. So I'll even speak personally on this one. Um, I document everything that I do within the workspace. I also document some of the office housework tasks, right? Because when it comes time for my evaluation, I do want people to see the length and the magnitude of the work that I've done in both spaces mm -hmm. because they may allow me in the future if they're seeing that I'm doing too much office work or this housework to lower that a little bit. And one thing that is often um, permissible is if you have a higher up or if you have um, somebody that says, you know, you're doing great work, but I see all the listing of the office housework that you've done and that's a little bit too much. You can ask them, well, you know, I am often asked for these things and it's a little bit challenging to say no. But if I could use your name as a suggestion um, to say, maybe I need to pass on this, then I will. How does this work? You can say, well, you know, so-and-so suggested that I really need to focus more on bringing clients in. Um, so unfortunately, I have to decline, right? But then you have another outside person who is often allowing you um, the ability to say no, right? And it, it comes off a little bit easier than saying no to yourself. Um, let's see, I've got two more questions that I'd love to get to. Um, one is, um, where did it go? I just saw it. There you go. Kamisha asks, what are other ways that Black women in particular can break the bias barrier? That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very loaded question. Um, so what, there was one thing that I saw that was interesting and it's in a case and I um, am not going to remember the exact woman who said this, which is unfortunate. But what she found was that she was linked to many different stereotypes within the organization. And she realized that through the conversations that she would have. One of the stereotypes that people had about her was that she wasn't good with numbers. So one thing was that she went upon a rhetorical um, strategy to try to figure out or try to put in people's brains that she was a numbers person. Literally within conversation, she would say, oh, you know me, I'm a numbers geek, or you know me, I'm a, definitely a data person. I'm all about the data. So if we start from the data, right? And so she was trying to reform people's opinions of her and also black women in general by linking them, uh, linking herself cognitively with being a data person, right? What we know from stereotypes is they are cognitive associations that people get from the media and from outside. The extent to which you can try to change them either through frequent co-representation of yourself and, and data or whatever you want to change that to be, then that's how you would do so. Great. Thank you. And we've got time for one more question. So I want to go back to one that was submitted a little earlier today. And that is, um, what uh, are some insights you can share about ways that companies can create a sense of belonging? We've talked a lot about the, the pipeline. So recruiting um, and it, recruiting talent and recruiting diverse talent, but how, how do you get people to stay once, once you've done that effective job? People's main concern in terms of belonging is, one, I want to feel like I can be myself. Whether I decide to or whether I want to have this professional sphere is on me, but I want to feel like it would be allowable if I came as myself. So there are various things that are seeped into organizations as little as the dress code, right? 
or as little as, um, are there ERGs for me? Is there a mentorship program for me? Do you support my identity in an outward facing way? So for example, if there's a big mega event that happens in the news concerning my racial group, my sexual orientation, are you commenting on that? And are you taking a stand? All of these things make me feel more included in the organization in that if I chose to, if I wanted to, I could be my authentic self, right? So those are a few steps that organizations can use for inclusion. Great, thank you. And let me scroll back through really quickly to see if I missed um, anything else. And while I'm scrolling, um, Gary had had a quick follow-up on the question about nonprofits. Are you aware of a kind of publicly available source that he might be able to go to or others might be able to go to to find data on nonprofit organizations? Yes, for everything. Um, more generally, Google Scholar. So Google.scholar allows you to tap into all of the academic papers that have been published in management. So you just type keywords on it. Um, uh, public institution, nonprofit institutions, and what you're looking for, diversity, and it'll return the data or the academic papers that people have done in this sphere. Great. Thank you, Erica. Thank you so much for spending your time and insights with us this morning. You know, we all know this is an issue. The data clearly shows that so many, frankly, most companies still grapple with. And I think bringing those to light to a broader audience and offering practical ways in which each of us can help to eliminate some of the bias in the process that can create a more welcoming way for more diverse pipeline. Um, if you could stop sharing your screen, I've got a couple of things I'd like to share with our, our folks before we leave today about our upcoming uh, business over breakfast. And let's see here, get the share going. I don't know why it always messes me up when I need to go share everything shifted one direction. <laughs> Let's see, here we go. Oh, no wonder. All right. So coming up, um, our last webinar for Business Over Breakfast of the year is coming up on December the 15th. We'll take a year in review and have a panel of folks that you've seen before. So we'll hear about how the economy has impacted our work and lives, some of the workplace trends, and some issues around uh, what the entrepreneurial climate ha um, has been facing. And then January the 5th, we will have an uh, a focus on intentional conversations, the science behind effective communication and team building. A couple of our featured short courses that are coming up are ever popular finance and accounting for non-financial managers, uh, facilitated by Tom Smith, who you've seen in our Economy and Me sessions. It's coming up December 14th and 15th. And then, as Tammy mentioned in our last webinar, our extended learning course applications are open through December the 5th. So you have a short window there. Check them out online. See if there are things. These are credit-bearing courses. You will be in classes with our MBA students. So you can learn more on our website. And then we have the Business of Healthcare for certificate for those who are either directly or tangentially involved in the healthcare industry, we invite you to check that out as well. And you can always reach out directly to my colleague, Tammy, for more information on any of our courses. Thanks for those that posted in the chat about the interest about the women's program. I think Tammy and I both posted a link to the website there and registrations will be open after the new year. With that, we say thank you so much for joining us this morning. We look forward to seeing you on the 15th. And Erica, thanks so much again for joining us this morning. Of course. Thank you all. Have a great day. Take care.